This is the AM Byte interview. And with us, we have the pleasure of being joined by Jonathan Barlow Gee. Jonathan, thank you very much for coming on the show. And how are you? Oh, I'm very good. Thank you very much for having me. Pleasure is all ours. I, uh, as we talked, I, I love your body of work. You've done such great scholarship for many years from all these fascinating topics. Your insights are engaging. They're intriguing. Really good scholarship. I think our audience will love uh, your body of work and everything else. But before we get to that, I'd like to welcome to the Moondog Vans. Vans, how are you? Okay. I'm uh, just weathering power outages and so forth here in Sunnyvale, California, but we'll hear about spiritual power now, right? <laughs> yes, we will. And uh, like I was telling you, maybe uh, Governor Newsom needed to save some money to pay for his tab at the French Laundry. So, but that's California because we are here in the middle of a snowstorm and the power is fine. So the spirits, the winter spirits are with us. So, so Jonathan, um, Again, I when I was doing all this research, I was like, God, you're like the the Renaissance man of uh, all these great topics. Uh, your work goes back to like 2010, at least what I saw on YouTube and read some of your books. And uh, you remind me of uh, what I like to call sort of the, the golden age of comparative mythology back in maybe 10 years ago when you had Graham Hancock, Acharya S, Timothy Freak, and many other researchers that were doing fascinating work on comparative mythology, uh, alternative archeology, span and this useful stuff that is, I, I feel, made the world better and uh, really expanded the consciousness of humanity. So how did you get into these esoteric topics? Well, it uh, goes back as far as the late 90s uh, of the last millennium, the last aeon. Uh, I was in high school and bored and started reading, uh, what was it, Time Life's Mysteries of the Unknown series, I believe it was, in uh, the library at high school. And that's when I started researching these topics. Uh, after that, I just stayed with it and... Uh, I keep researching them today, but uh, it seems that after a certain point, I kind of hit a peak or a plateau uh, where it seemed that I had learned as much as there was to know about most of these. And then I started coming up with my own theories based on what I'd learned. Yeah, well, great job. And for the audience, I would definitely suggest you check out his website and his YouTube channel for uh, so much good stuff. And we definitely want to hit on a lot of this good stuff on the show. So why don't we start with more or less the, the, the central theme, I feel, of your work, or uh, at least at the very least, it's a starting point, And that is the Pythagorean order of death. Could you tell the audience what that is, Jonathan? Uh, certainly, that is a group that I created. Uh, that uh, I created with a few other friends of mine after we left a uh, forum online where we all met. Uh, the forum uh, that we met at was uh, an Illuminati themed forum uh, and we all left it because we felt that it was doing a poor job representing that theme. Uh, we decided to, as our final degree uh, personal project, uh, create something that might reflect it uh, better, in our opinion. And uh, to that end, I created the Pythagorean Order of Death, after which uh, some of the original members, uh, some of the founding members left because they didn't like what I had created and wanted to do their own thing. Uh, but that was in probably 2007, uh, 2008. And uh, there's been a more or less continuous web presence for the POD uh, since then. Uh, the material has expanded a bit. Uh, there's been some amendments and uh, some uh, abridgments uh, released since then, but there's about 13 degrees is split into about five pretty different uh, 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 schools or uh, 
uh, systems. Uh, and each one of those has a PDF. Uh, and then there's the omnibus that's released more or less annually that updates uh, an abridged version from all of them. And uh, yeah. And are you able to share what are the, some of the tenets of the Pythagorean order of death? Uh, certainly. Uh, the basic tenets are that uh, the main goal is uh, the mission statement is to disseminate the uh, the information about what I call the uh, Atlantean democracy system of, of government, which is in short, uh, an alternative proposition to uh, the document that seems to be, or one of the documents that seems to be the motivating driving force behind the modern, what could be called a new world order of the globalist uh, faction of the order of death. Uh, and that is uh, the protocols of the learned elders of Zion. So the uh, Atlantean democracy system is an attempt to create an, uh, a pluralist, decentralized, minarchist version of a global government as an alternative to a global monarchy uh, as proposed in the protocols. Uh, the history of the Atlantean democracy system uh, is complex and partially fictional, at least, or at least partially speculative. Um, and so far as there's no way to prove it one way or the other. Uh, but um, the system, as far as I've designed or received or understood it to be is basically dependent also on a free energy uh, system of uh, wireless electricity replacing the actual economy that we have today. So it's kind of a pipe dream in a sense, but um, maybe useful, maybe something that uh, in 100 or 200 years could be a cons uh, considered a useful goal to consider. Interesting. Correct if I'm wrong, but I thought we thought the protocols of Zion or whatever the hell they're called, never read it, but I thought they were false, just a, a polemic. Well, 1984 is a fiction too, but some people do use that as a, uh, a manual instead of a warning. <laughs> yeah, that is true. Or Brave New World or the movie exactly. the matrix or anything else <laughs> and the, the only real difference between the protocols and the others is that the others posed themselves as works of fiction whereas the protocols purported to be factual but whether or not it's factual is irrelevant to that extent <laughs> and in your uh, in the pythagorean order of death uh you talk about two types of uh uh, there's two types of individuals, the, the psychic conspirator and the psychic, psychic revolutionary. Who are those? Okay, well, uh, the order of death itself, uh, which is a topic that I got the name for uh, from an Alex Jones documentary about the Bohemian Grove and a song by a public Image Limited with Johnny Rotten, the former singer of the Sex Pistols, uh, called Order of Death. Both of them are called Order of Death. And the way I've applied that term is to the group of all people who are aware that they are psychic or telepathic or to some extent clairvoyant. Uh, so in, in my experience, all living forms uh, all living beings, all life forms have the capacity for nonverbal or uh, non-physical communication. Uh, what we're doing right now, talking on the computer is a form of uh, indirect communication. And uh, I believe that animals of the more developed species also use a form of this uh, by passing messages along from one to another over greater distances. So I believe that uh, all life forms are 
at least in potential telepathic, and that this manifests itself in uh, the higher evolved animal species as a kind of animal internet or a naturally living uh, connected uh, network of minds. So uh, I would call uh, the animal internet uh, ubiquitous to all living beings, but the order of death is only the people and presumably animals, but mainly the people uh, who are aware that they are psychic uh, and who use their telepathic ability uh, and their potential for clairvoyance actively, more so than passively. Uh, of the order of death, there are two types and those are uh, psychic uh, conspirators who want to continue to use their telepathy to convince people who don't believe in telepathy that they, there is no such thing as telepathy and that telepathy is impossible and that it doesn't exist and that they don't have it uh, in order to disempower them and to continue to use their own telepathy to essentially rule the world. And those are the psychic conspirators within the order of death uh, who want to continue to use their powers over the cult of sleep, which are basically psychic life forms that have been convinced they aren't psychic or that they aren't telepathic or that they, for whatever reason, aren't allowed to uh, exchange ideas mentally only. Uh, the other form of person in the order of death is the psychic revolutionary and the psychic revolutionary wants to free all minds to their full psychic uh, potential and to uh, reveal to everybody alive that we are all psychic and that there is uh, a mental only uh, ideal form of network that we all share and we can all communicate our ideas through it. Uh, that mental network would be the uh, Enochian communications system which is a whole other topic. Yeah, we can definitely touch upon this, uh, upon that topic. Uh, and yes, we've done many shows on the idea that all humans are psychic. At some point, we lost that ability or it was suppressed by the powers that be. So what you're talking is definitely uh, very known to the audience and very known to the topic of or the ethos of this show. So moving ahead... Uh, could you tell us who are the Neo-Sethians? Uh, the Neo-Sethians are es essentially the modern psychic conspirators in the order of death. Uh, insofar as their agenda is to maintain power. Uh, but what their philosophy is, is the second comingism or uh, eschatological end of days uh, belief, which is based on 2000, at least 2000 year old prophecy, uh, the book of revelations, and which they essentially believe that if they bring about these certain signs of the times for the end of days, then they will be able to force a second coming of Jesus, which is highly problematic in my opinion, because it involves essentially trying to destroy the world in order to summon God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We definitely don't want that. And for example, um, you mentioned in, I will forget what, uh, documentary or what youtuber you say that let's say somebody like alistair crowley would be a neo-sethian so is a neo-sethian by what he does or can we say this is sort of a a continuation or of a, of an ideology going down throughout history uh a bit of both definitely both um he was uh, crowley himself was uh I would consider him to be Neo-Sethian insofar as he brought about uh, a new age or welcomed the dawn of the new aeon. Uh, but I believe he did so in a way that was, in a sense, 
calendrically premature uh, by about a hundred years. Uh, if you look at in the book of law, his own uh, explanation for the term eon, it is a period of about 2000 years. But if you look at the dates he gives for the speculated past aeons, uh, they don't correspond with that measurement. So if you take just the measurement itself of an aeon and you apply it back, then you have 2,000 years before the present, uh, the time of Jesus, uh, 2,000 years before that, roughly the time of uh, David and Solomon and Moses, uh, 2,000 years before that, perhaps Abraham or Noah, uh, that era, and 2,000 years before that, you would have the uh, beginning of the universe according to the uh, biblical literalists. So uh, each eon, supposedly there is a world savior archetype that manifests itself. And at the present, uh, or rather uh, 2000 years ago, there was a group of Gnostics called the Sethites. And their main belief was in uh, the second coming of Seth, at the time who was the uh, third son of Adam and Eve and the firstborn uh, mortal human who had both uh, wisdom from having inherited the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, as well as uh, was mortal and lacked the uh, tree of immortality uh, from the tree of life or the fruit of immortality from the tree of life. Um, so they believed in the Gnostic era that uh, Seth would resurrect or reappear or reincarnate. And when they saw Jesus, they were the earliest, some of the earliest converts to what we call today Christianity uh, because they became some of his closest followers, apostles and disciples. So now uh, 2000 years after that or an aeon after that, uh, we have uh, Alistair Crowley attempting to explain to people that we were about to enter this, this new aeon, this new age of uh, vast changes to our society in the same sense as had happened with uh, Jesus and uh, even Muhammad some, I think, 400 years later. Uh, the early era of the last aeon was highly contentious. And Crowley was essentially attempting to say we were entering into that phase, uh, the equinox of the gods and, and so forth, when the aeon, one aeon changed over to another. And this is part of a calendrical uh, a cycle, a natural cycle measured by the, the calendar. Uh, and if one uses aeons instead of months on a base 12 calendar, uh, one can use this structure to measure even the ice age cycles. So to a certain extent, this uh, process or this cyclical, uh, every aeon, there's a world savior type figure that manifests and uh, exists uh, is theoretically part of a naturally occurring cycle that also involves space weather, uh, the peak of the sunspot cycle uh, the entrance of a plasma sheet in the galactic uh, orbit of the Earth and the Sun around the galactic core, uh, as well as increased asteroids, um, even possibly an electromagnetic pole reversal, uh, possible crustal displacement, all of these sorts of things that uh, we've had people talking about, uh, quote unquote, disaster theorists talking about. Uh, for the last hundred years or so as part of entry into this new age. Uh, I would say Crowley was uh, attempting to, and I keep using the phrase attempting to, but uh, I'm not sure how, to what extent he's really succeeded, but uh, I would say that definitely he was one of the pe people who was trying to uh, bring awareness to this, uh, this process. So what we have is uh, this group who is attempting some sort of apotheosis, becoming divine by bringing about the end of the world. And they work through uh, taking advantage of certain astrological or time cycles 
to gain this power. Is that basically uh, a, su- a good summary, Jonathan? A hundred percent. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. I would say that. That's the tagline or the, the elevator pitch. If Crowley was like walking in the, man, we can end the world and we can all become God and ta ta ta. We could do it this way. And this must go back probably, I mean, as your work has shown and for the audience, Jonathan has tons of charts, uh, gematria uh, maps. I mean, everything. It's just, it's a huge body of work and um, he puts a lot of evidence in this. Can we say this goes back to the days of Atlantis? Well, uh, again, this, be- this uh, steps into the field of speculation. Right, of course. Because uh, if you were to say, for example, what do I believe about all of this? I'm not sure I believe in any of it. Uh, I want it to all be a voluntary and an optional type of philosophy that any of this exists and is relevant in any way. Uh, Part of wanting people to wake up to their psychic potential and being a psychic revolutionary myself means that uh, we have to realize that all of these uh, myths are partially fictional or have become fictionalized in the history of them, but that um, they still can teach us a core moral uh, lesson. So for example, the myth of Atlantis, uh, whether or not that's a hundred percent valid and accurate description of the past history prior to uh, archaeological evidence for some kind of world flood or great deluge. Um, it can still teach us a valuable moral lesson for ourselves today about the application of certain forms of technology and the ability for ourselves to destroy ourselves using that technology and uh, why we shouldn't pursue that well said indeed i would agree for some reason i'm thinking of i think it's irenaeus or epiphanius talking about the the ophites trying to cast or the canites i believe actually trying to uh, cast uh, magic to bring down heaven upon earth and destroy the world so that definitely had some neo-sethian vibe or original sethian vibe so uh vance from your standpoint uh is jonathan uh, is he what do you think about uh, what he's saying? Of course, I've read uh, many of his books. I've seen a lot of his videos on YouTube. But from your perspective, uh, how does it sound? Well, it's interesting. Um, I don't know enough about it to really form a full opinion. But one question I had was, Jonathan, uh, um, why is it called the order of death? How does how does death factor into the you know the global um, or governance and ESP and so forth? Oh, that's a great question. Um, This is something that I haven't participated in personally because, uh, again, I see no uh, personal benefit from it or even social benefit. But the majority of the uh, esoteric schools of mystery uh, and the secret societies that practice uh, modernly what we would traditionally consider magic all of them involve some sort of death-centered ritual uh, at some point in their degree system where the individual has to undergo what they call ego death. And uh, in many of them, this is forced upon them or even brought about in a surprising way, which is traumatic to the ego. Uh, uh, For example, the third degree of uh, the Blue Lodge of Uh, Freemasonry nowadays involves a uh, ritual where one is uh, ceremonially buried alive almost in a sense. Uh, And this is the purpose of this, the moral of this is to encourage people to meditate on their own mortality uh, and to think about themselves as a finite, a, a temporally finite being. Uh, and to encourage them to think, well, what can I do while I'm here in this lifetime that would help improve the situations that I see? Uh, Of course, it's all very ethically uh, ambiguous, 
after that, how one applies that uh, knowledge and what they, what they learn from that moral. Uh, but all of them do have that particular uh, death obsession in common. And I, I think that that may be what distinguishes, for example, the cult of sleep who are psychic but believe themselves to not be from the order of death who are those who know that they are psychic is having meditated upon one's own mortality and uh, understood the magnitude of that uh, meaning in their own personal lives. Yeah. How about life after death? Do you think um, in, in this system, uh, can you use ESP to communicate with souls that have passed from the physical world or how does that work? Well, again, this is something that I don't practice doing. And for, from my perspective, it's speculative, although uh, there are ample, there's ample evidence of people that uh, believe that to be possible and who do use their uh, abilities to do something similar to that, at least. Uh, I'm not going to say that those people are 100% right or 100% wrong. Uh, just that from my personal experience, it remains uh, speculative and I can't say certainly uh, for sure one way or another, but it shouldn't be ruled out at all. Yeah, fair enough. You know, one more thing that I had uh, before um, Miguel continues with his questions is um, a lot of people would hear global governance as a bad thing, you know, like a, a bunch of tyrants trying to rule people and kill off a lot of people for the benefit of the entire earth and so forth. Uh, uh, I assume the global governance that you're talking about, uh, you know, Atlantean based is something different than the kind of globalism that people are talking about, or is it? Uh, it's a, meant to be 180 degree opposite from that philosophy of that globalism has to be evil. Uh, uh, that again, that relates to the protocols of the elders of Zion and associates that philosophy with their, uh, proposition of a global monarch, uh, and, uh, Atlantean democracy is, as I've tried to line it out or, uh, lay it forth is that, uh, the premise is that the, uh, global government, even if it's inevitable, doesn't have to impinge in any way on the day-to-day -day free lives or rights of individuals. Uh, civil liberties should be maximized under such a situation, uh, in my personal opinion, and in no way minimized. Uh, I, I agree. How about centralization versus, uh, um, do you believe in uh, layers of governments or, or like just one huge global government? Uh, well, the, the uh, Atlantean democracy system basically has a very small uh, central government uh, that has no army. It has no ability to enforce its dictates. Its so-called dictates would be more like philosophical recommendations. Uh, it's meant to, in a form, uh, of, uh, in a sense, entrap uh, the people who would self-select into positions of authority over others uh, into this almost American gladiators like uh, situation where they then debate or even fight and kill each other uh, to determine the, the you know, who, whose point is valid. But uh, because they have no, uh, no real say over anybody else's personal lives in the whole world, uh, it would just be a form of almost entertainment uh, to see these so-called philosopher kings uh, battle it out uh, in rhetoric and uh, even possibly physically just to determine, you know, what they think is the right course of action for humanity when, you know, nobody has to abide by their, uh, their findings. Yeah, interesting. What do you think, Miguel? Yeah, it is very interesting. Uh... Um, I was going to ask, uh, of course, when we start getting into these topics, it's uh, inevitable that we ask about uh, the reptilians. And of course, you deal with reptilians in a lot of your work. Uh, what's your what's your take on them? Well, um, I believe the reptilian hindbrain is more or less uh, 
an acceptable description for the uh, rear uh, cerebrum's organelles or their suborgans uh, because it occurs even in reptiles. It's basically what a reptile's brain looks like is the back portion of our own brains. So when one is, uh, when a human, uh, when a person is using these parts of their brain more than their forebrain or their midbrain, uh, they're acting in a reptilian type of fashion and they're thinking in a reptilian type of fashion. Uh, the people who, you know, kind of hide in that or cloak themselves in that, uh, that sensation of fear versus love being the ultimate uh, lifeline of, you know, those are the only two options that they see because that's their binary and they think in a simpler format of, of reality than mammals or people. Um, these people are in a sense de-evolving uh, even now from being the complete mammals and the complete human beings that they could be. So in the future, what I believe will happen in one possible future is that the people who are currently expressing this reptilianist or reptilianism uh, now, this, this trait of being uh, fear driven and uh, curious about other emotions, but unable to understand them. Uh, these people will eventually uh, create a subspecies of humanity uh, that will itself continue to evolve as well. So the people that are more or less reptilians now will eventually their subspecies group uh, will become more like avians or birds uh, in some format, uh, perhaps like the angels are depicted, the cherubim are depicted in ancient art uh, with wings symbolically. Uh, and other subspecies of humanity will also form uh, along with them, which will be more mammalian uh, or more insectoid even, uh, as they would go up or down the evolutionary uh, ladder. And then this will form a kind of class structure or class system and a social hierarchy between these different groups of what I've called animal factions. Uh, or animalistic factions. Yeah, I'm and, always. Uh, I'm this sorry. This is what I in this. In, sorry, I cut out for a minute. But this entire uh, description of reality is what I refer to as the worst future world line of three possible future world lines, and the better one being a return to Atlantean democracy. Yeah, I've always. So, in this sense, I believe if we can. Go ahead. If we continue to follow in the direction of the protocols, uh, then we'll end up de-evolving into uh, animalistic subspecies. And uh, if we follow Atlantean democracy or any other alternative uh, to the protocols, uh, then we'll end up in a better world line in the future and uh, things will continue to evolve and progress upward. I've always uh, agreed with, or I agree with you that the whole lizard people has to be or is people who are dominated by their base uh, emotion, not even emotional, but predatory part. And sometimes I miss David Icke talking about the reptile people because I think that's what he was talking about too, not taking them that literally, if you would. And uh, has your views changed with uh, the strangeness in 2020 and the continued strangeness, strangeness of 2021? Or do you think this is just part of the cycle? Well, uh, the way I understand the cycle is that it is uh, peaking currently uh, between 2000, the year 2000, uh, when on May 5th, there was an alignment of the seven planets of antiquity until uh, December 21st, 2021, or sorry, 2012 now, uh, the past, no longer the future. Uh, when uh, the sun and earth and galactic core all aligned as predicted by the Mayans, uh, then that was the peak 
uh, 11 year period in the uh, sunspot cycle for the Aeon. Uh, so uh, we saw the maximum amount of solar activity then, which caused the maximum amount of uh, essentially heat in the global atmosphere. And everybody uh, could identify that as either global warming or as uh, climate change, either one, uh, because it was exacerbated by human pollution, but it wasn't entirely caused by it. So uh, at this point in that cycle, we're at a peak for space weather activity. Uh, and also, I believe, at a period of convergence between these timelines uh, in co uh, comparison to Aleister Crowley's uh, concept of the equinox of the gods. I think that uh, when uh, one aeon calendrically rolls over into the next, uh, it corresponds to all of these uh, astronomical or astrological type events. Uh, and uh, what you see on the earth during that period of time is usually a period of great social upheaval and uh, a lot of philosophies forming, a lot of so-called false prophets and a lot of uh, so-called magicians, self-proclaiming magicians running around that, you know, 600, 400 years ago, you wouldn't have seen that many. And that that's uh, the cause, but I do believe that after the year 2029, uh, these timelines will begin to diverge again and the peak uh, sunspot cycle phase will be diminishing and that what we've called global warming will begin to wane and descend into a cooling phase. Yeah, you mentioned too in your work, uh, the great burners that happen or represent peak of the sunspot cycle. For example, you talk about Ahura, Mazda, Shemesh, Ishtar. Uh, who are these great burners? Uh, well, the idea of a great burner is essentially that of the cultural hero or world savior that I mentioned earlier that every 2000 years or so, there's this uh, person that comes along that brings forth or ushers in all of this change uh, culturally and socially and spiritually even. Uh, for example, uh, 2000 years ago, Jesus would have, could have been considered a great burner. Uh, the uh, concept of uh, Tezcatli Poca and of Kukul Khan, those were based on the uh, same sort of premise uh, Noah, uh, Zayasudra or Utnapishnim uh, would have been one of these as well after having preserved culture from destruction in the flood. Uh, anyone who brings about a massive social change, uh, even uh, Martin Luther during one of the uh, periods of lower solar activity and uh, a colder era could be considered a form of uh, burner or great burner. Uh, John D as well, uh, again, Muhammad, uh, the prophet of Islam, uh, even though these are on off periods in the 2000 year aeonic cycle, they more or less still overlap with a 500 year cycle that occurs uh, uh, within that. Do you have any speculation, Jonathan, or who might be a burner today as we speak? I certainly don't. I mean, um, I'm trying to rack my brain. <laughs> I see a lot of false prophets, that's for sure, but no burners. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, the only difference is really capitalization, I think. Uh, anybody can bring data forth, be a world teacher, but uh, especially nowadays with the uh, cybernetic internet anybody can teach the entire world whatever they want uh but in terms of being a world savior the information they teach has to be beneficial uh not just to them personally in terms of making the money but it has to improve the situation socially for the entire world uh and not even just humanity uh but for our equilibrium with nature and other species as well. 
So, um, yeah, I think it's, it's likely that uh, between aeonic peaks, uh, there are lesser burners who are more like false prophets or, or uh, proselytes or people that uh, profit from, uh, that profiteer from making prophecies. Uh, and then at the peak of the cycle, you may have somebody who is more earnest, more honest, and isn't in it just for uh, a buck uh, and uh, maybe can make a larger difference. But then again, maybe not. So how about George Soros? Uh, arguably, no matter whether you think he's um, funding good or bad um, causes uh, openly claims to be trying to influence society on a global basis with lots and lots of influence and money. So is he a possible burner? Uh, more likely uh, uh, from the perspective of the psychic conspirators, yes. Uh, from the perspective of psychic revolutionaries, he'd be the opposite. Uh, somebody who's trying to uh, quell the fire of human psyche uh, from flourishing. Uh, and so far as, you know, the causes, the causes that any philanthropist backs, be they good or evil, uh, popularly, or according to the populist, uh, populace, uh, whatever causes they back, they're doing it financially. So even Elon Musk, as perhaps a political counterexample, uh, is applying financial uh, gains that he made perhaps scrupulously or unscrupulously by inventing PayPal, uh, I think. Uh, he's applying those, those uh, financial gains to going to Mars and creating Neuralink and the, the Skylink satellite system, whatever those are. Uh, and again, he, he probably believes that he's doing the right thing and for the right reasons and that what he's doing is benevolent and beneficent and good and will improve society and, and humanity and nature in general. Uh, in a sense, only time can determine uh, whether or not he's right or wrong. But, you know, from learning, learning from past history, uh, if you look at people who have gone before, who have attempted to uh, force global uh, or globalist agendas to occur, uh, you have people like Alexander the Great or uh, Julius Caesar or Napoleon or Hitler uh, or George W. Bush, and these are all people that are considered, in hindsight, less popular than they were during their own lives, which I think is an interesting point about the uh, great burner or a true messiah or prophet would be that during their own lives, they're vilified. They're completely uh, shunned and exiled at best, if not crucified, murdered uh, violently. So, uh, in a sense, it does behoove psychic revolutionaries as long as we or they are the minority to remain more or less in the shadows or secretive or occult even uh, so that we don't get murdered by the people who are in charge who want their, pol their political agendas to be seen historically as right and good, uh, but that don't want any alternatives to be allowed. Yeah, that sounds good to me. I like, um, I've always said that globalism would be great if the uh, people that were, you know, in, uh, were ruling in an enlightened manner as opposed to just power for its own sake. So I love it. I would agree, but uh, they want to be gods on this earth and they want complete control over society and all the resources. So I don't see one right now. And uh, good point how they're vilified. Again, we can talk about how Muhammad was on his heels most of his life. life. And of course, uh, the great uh, example would be Jesus, somebody who, as you said, was vilified, uh, paid, for, paid with his life and so forth. But Jesus is an interesting one, don't you think, Jonathan? Because in reality, he pretty much was a nobody when he died. And he really was a nobody for several generations. I mean, he had his loyal group and the religion grew and it grew, but it took centuries before it really uh, 
spread across the earth. So that's what do you think about that one? That uh, somebody has uh, he had no footprint at the beginning. No, I agree. Uh, it's tragic, and I think a lot of his ethical teachings that uh, he spoke himself personally got twisted in the uh, not just the first few hundred years that following his life and death, but definitely uh, after the institutionalization of Catholicism uh, as a as a global force since then. Uh, I think his ethical teachings have are are all but lost on the ears of modern the majority of modern christians even and you who do you think was his original inner circle uh you said it might have been the sethians can we say that uh basically mary magdalene was you might say uh, his right hand man or woman uh what what how do you feel about the original christians well, from my research on this uh, topic, what it appears to me is though uh, is as though uh, the New Testament Gospels themselves uh, may be Roman forgeries. They may be written in the first uh, hundred years or so following the life of Christ uh, by people, uh, Pliny the Elder, the Younger. Uh, possibly for the uh, Peso family or for the uh, Augustinian emperors uh, as a means of propaganda to encourage people to uh, succumb to imperialism by turning the other cheek and only using nonviolence uh, as, a, as a methodology. Uh, however, uh, I do believe also that uh, the person of Jesus uh, or the character that uh, the person in the new testament was based on was an actual living individual uh who did uh certain uh that taught certain uh, uh certain gnostic i suppose one could say uh beliefs uh two thousand years ago and uh may have used uh what could be considered today a form of magic uh, ritualist or ceremonial magic uh, to perform something that would be considered by uh, subsequent believers as miracles, uh, miracles of healing, uh, as opposed to dark magic. But nevertheless, uh, uh, if you read, for example, the uh, uh, was it the Babylonian Talmud, I believe, of the era, it describes this uh, Yeshu and his trial as uh, that of a magician who was uh, using a name of God that he had gotten from an Egyptian uh, temple uh, to you know, essentially break the rabbinical laws that said you shouldn't practice any form of uh, spiritual uh, uh, act or uh, healing practice even uh, on Sabbaths, uh, Saturdays. So when he did that, uh, they considered him a criminal or a black or dark wizard, uh, tried him and put him to death. And it was relatively unceremonious at the time. Uh, it didn't make necessarily the biggest stir in the uh, Roman empire when a uh, supposed terrorist from Judea was executed. Uh, it was not as big a deal even as when uh, Osama bin Laden was executed nowadays. Uh, because at the time, Jesus wasn't even the greatest of the terrorist uh, groups active in Judea. Uh, Judas Iscariot and the, uh, the uh, Herodian, anti-Herodian Maccabeans were. But um, it seems to me that the uh, original group of Jesus's apostles and disciples were comprised of the Essenes of some members of the Essenes of Qumran, uh, some members of the Iskari or the Sicari uh, assassins uh, uh, group of uh, political terrorists, uh, some members of just basic Gnostic or uh, Coptic uh, philo philosophical and religious belief systems. And uh, that, uh, for example, James the Just, there's a lot of uh, modern speculation that he was a brother uh, 
by blood to Jesus, but I suspect that it was probably a half brother uh, who had the same father, but a different, uh, or rather who had the same mother, but a different father. Uh, in, the, in the trial documents, they uh, compare Yeshu to a, uh, like uh, someone who had been uh, sired by, uh, 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 well, in the Babylonian Talmud trial documents, they describe Yeshu as by comparing him to someone who had been sired by uh, a foreigner on uh, the wife of a high priest. But this means either that Jesus himself was similarly to that person, uh, a bastard of a Roman soldier and uh, the wife of, say, uh, Shimei and Caiaphas, for example, uh, is left open to interpretation. So it's, it's impossible to say with certainty, but there is a high degree of likelihood that Jesus uh, was born uh, from the rape of his mother by a Roman soldier who was, uh, his mother was the wife of the high priest of the Essene community at Qumran, who were the exiled high priests from uh, Jerusalem over the state of Israel that had become Judea. Um, so when, uh, if, if you look in the, uh, the Bible, when Jesus was born, his parents fled with him into Egypt. Uh, he spent time there and supposedly, according to the Babylonian Talmud, stole uh, the name of God from a temple there. Uh, and then when he returned, he returned to Qumran uh, and was unwelcome. Uh, they called him the wicked priest in their documents and said that James the Just, who was his half-brother, uh, who was the rightful son of uh, Jesus's mother and uh, Jesus's stepfather, who was the high priest, uh, they said James the Just was the rightful heir and Jesus was a, uh, an upstart. So what I believe happened then was that Jesus went across the Dead Sea to the east coast of it, the east shore. Uh, Qumran was on the west coast of it. He went across the Dead Sea and wrote what's been called the Angel Scroll, in which I believe he wrote down the name not only of uh, God that he stole from the temple in Egypt, but also names of various other uh, magical incantations that he could use to uh, create miraculous seeming uh, events. Uh, the angel scroll since then is the only way that we know that somebody named Yeshua ben Paddy even existed 2,000 years ago from an archaeological perspective, uh, as opposed to just uh, rumors in later literature. Uh, and the angel scroll itself is, has only been publicly admitted to existing uh, once uh, by Stephen Fan of uh, the University of the Holy Land uh, in 1999 and then was subsequently redacted or retracted by him as being uh, an accurate uh, or legitimate piece of apocrypha. Uh, he was only shown it by its uh, owner in a private collection and he didn't release the owner's name. Uh, so all we have to prove that this document itself even exists is one circumstantial uh, description by Stephen Fan uh, nowadays. And uh, other than that, there's no proof that Jesus himself ever wrote anything down. Uh, yeah. So the early Christians themselves would have all been going on hearsay uh, on like the writings in the Gospel of Thomas, who wrote down the sayings of Jesus uh, and these sorts of things, whereas uh, in reality, there, there was likely a book that Christ or that Jesus himself wrote. And that was the angel scroll of Yeshua ben Padia. Yeah, I love your reconstruction. Uh, great work. And I lean towards uh, being a mythicist. 
But as I tell people, my second option would be Jesus, Jesus the magician. And uh, I think it's so obvious when you start when you start digging in. And of course, you've got the work of Morton Smith and Robert Connor and others. Uh, Jesus was definitely a magician of the ancient times, uh, probably battling the Nephilim and the Archons and other beings on high spiritual places while performing some uh, stuff down here on earth. And what about something like, um, you mentioned the Gospel of Thomas. Uh, what about something really high of high philosophy, high theology, complex, like the secret book of John or the Apocryphon of John, as some call it? Where do you think this comes from? Uh, original teachings of Jesus? Or is this a, a later work by some very uh, mystic, ecstatic Gnostics? Uh, I'd say it's in that particular instance of an apocrypha, it's got its own particular history. Uh, it, I'm pretty sure I haven't read it recently enough to be a hundred percent sure, but I'm pretty sure it was written uh, or at least said after the crucifixion and after the resurrection of Christ. Uh, and it's uh, Jesus explaining to John uh, the apostle, the, uh, nature of cosmology, uh, the afterlife, and for example, the spirits that rule over the different parts of the human body, uh, and explaining that there's a, an aura or a unique soul that governs every living thing, including every blade of grass. Uh, so it's possible, it's most likely, pardon me, that that was taught by Jesus to his apostle, uh, John, during the lifetime of Jesus, that John wrote it down as being taught to him after the death of Jesus by the reincarnated or re, uh, resurrected Christ. Uh, and then it was written down again by another scribe following that uh, from the account of John, the uh, apostle. And the, the later scribe uh, may have taken a few also uh, uh, liberties with the text. So it's possible that, uh, well, it's definite there's a grain of truth in it, but it's also possible that uh, there's a large degree of subsequent translational errors or accidental obfuscations along the way. No, that makes perfect sense. Uh, yeah, and I think uh, I'm trying to figure out, uh, let's see, what was the book I was reading last night? Uh, give me one second, because I think, uh, again, I was reading it uh, <laughs> while, I was, while the kids were doing jujitsu. I was on the bench uh, reading the book, uh, Forbidden Gospels. And you mentioned, you mentioned in one part, and I don't know if this is your theory, you're quoting somebody, or maybe you're even speculating, Jonathan, but you say that uh, Mary Magdalene wrote the entire Nag Hammadi library and James the Just wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah. Yeah. I think that they may have either written them or been curators, more likely that they were curators of these texts. Uh, James the Just would have been the chief priest uh, at the time that Jesus came uh, back from his exile. Uh, under the high priest at the Essene community of Qumran. Uh, so the high priest would have been Shimeon or uh, Simon uh, Caiaphas, and the uh, chief priest would have been James the Just and uh, his son. Uh, James the Just, therefore, would have been the, the chief scribe or uh, chief editor uh, of the scribes at Qumran. Uh, and Mary Magdalene, following uh, the life and death of Jesus, uh, was said to have gone into Egypt, where the Nag Hammadi Library was eventually discovered. And uh, I believe that she was curator of those uh, scrolls as well, and the keeper of that library. Uh, and that also, uh, incidentally, originally, it was in the reverse, uh, meant to be read in the reverse order from the uh, compilation of it today uh yeah for example we start with uh uh in the nag hammadi library uh that's published in books today we start with uh one story and end with another whereas i think in the original edition uh it would have started with what we call the last 
uh, entry now and, and ended with the first. Fascinating and very interesting. And um, let's see, do I, how does uh, the, how does Paul fall into your, uh, your reconstruction or speculation? Uh, Paul or Saul came along later. Uh, I believe he was an agent under uh, uh, Roman influence by uh, Shimon Caiaphas or uh, uh, even uh, Josephus, uh, who was a uh, uh, meant to uh, destabilize the early Christian cult and uh, advocate that they break away from the traditional uh, Hebrew uh, religious uh, beliefs and uh, practices. Uh, for example, uh, encouraging that one didn't need to be circumcised, uh, that one could uh, practice the, uh, the uh, Passover uh, or the, uh, uh, the Last Supper as opposed to the Passover feast. And uh, one didn't need to keep the uh, lunar solar calendar, that one could go by only the solar civic calendar, uh, and all those sorts of, that one could be saved by baptism uh, and repentance, all of the doctrines that eventually became the uh, uh, sacraments of the uh, Catholic Church uh, were essentially invented by uh, Saul or Paul later. And I don't believe that really any of them were necessarily uh, advocated for by Jesus himself necessarily. Uh, we have definitely the Lord's prayer uh, was spoken by Jesus, but other than that, you know, the, the different beliefs of full immersion baptism or just sprinkling water over the brow or how much wine and how much wafer we have to eat to, you know, receive the sacrament of the transubstantiation. All of that argument is irrelevant because it's all ex, ex post facto. It's all after Jesus's life and death and had nothing to do with his teachings. Yeah, well said. And uh, before we move on from those early Christian times, I have to ask you, as uh, we've done some shows on this deity from both a uh, Jungian and a uh, scholarly perspective, I've been on a couple of podcasts talking about this entity, and that is Abraxas. How do you see Abraxas? Well, Abraxas is a Gnostic parody of the Hebrew monotheist concept of Jehovah. Uh, Abraxas was not necessarily considered a real god, more of a satire or parody cartoon version of God as the Demiurge or the universal God as the universal Demiurge. Uh, so it had uh, the feet of snakes, uh, which in uh, Buddhism you find as being one of the three poisons. Uh, it had the breastplate uh, or, or chest piece uh, of a boar or wild pig uh, and uh, that's one of also one of the three Buddhist poisons, and the head of a uh, rooster or cock, uh, which is the last of the three Buddhist poisons or uh, uh, symbolic uh, semi or demi uh, sub elements in uh, Buddhist uh, cosmology, equivalent to the tattvas in Hindu, and to salt, sulfur, and mercury in alchemy. Uh, I don't know if uh, Abraxas was necessarily, I mean, I'm, personally, I tend towards atheism, personally. Uh, I don't believe that there's necessarily such a thing as a universal creator deity. Uh, I do believe that there are evil psychic forces on earth uh, that possess people, evil philosophies that can possess people to do evil things. Uh, but I don't see necessarily there being a, a real plethora of good philosophies that likewise possess people to do good things. So I tend to think that the uh, majority of uh, the earth uh, psychically is ruled by what we would ourselves consider to be an evil force uh, or the devil, one could say. 
So in that regard, I'm more of a Cathar in traditional historic beliefs. Uh, I believe that Jesus would, would uh, any great burner would be a manifestation of this force or at least tempted to be um, uh, this evil satanic world king type one uh, lust for power. Uh, but um, yeah, in the regards to uh, of the Cathars, that's what you're talking about. The king of the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very interesting. And like, uh, go ahead. Yeah. No, I'm. I guess I'm done. I'm just rambling. No, no. This is fascinating. Uh, so, what? How would you put, uh, for example, the? We have to talk about it when we're talking about any sort of esoteric Christianity, Judaism, or Islam, and that is, of course, Enoch and the Watchers and the Nephilim. How do how do they fall under your uh, under your work? Uh, well, I've done a lot of research on on the Enochian tradition, uh, and it started for a rather silly reason. Uh, in two thousand three. Uh, I wasn't very interested in magic and mysticism as much as I was with metaphysics and uh, theoretical cosmologies. So I wrote a book called The Metaphysician's Desk Reference, which I had self-published and which is available on Amazon in a really rudimentary edition. Lots of spelling errors and grammar errors, and it's very poorly edited. I didn't pay to have it edited, so I edited it myself. Uh, it's a really poor edition. A uh, better edition is available as a PDF online uh, without any of the, or without most of the spelling errors. Anyway, after I put that book out, I realized uh, that there was somebody named John D. And that John D., uh, not unlike me, uh, and before I was born, long before I was around, had studied many of these same topics. Uh, and my name being John Gee and his name being John D. and a lot of our works overlapping, I realized at some point I was going to have to find out who he was and study his works and be able to provide an answer when asked, what about John D. since your name is John Gee? So that's when I started researching the Enochian material and I tore through uh, what I could find pretty quickly. Uh, there's the Enochian magic of John D and Edward Kelly, of course, from the 15 and early 1600s. And then uh, there's the basis for that, uh, essentially, which is the legend of the biblical patriarch Enoch, who lived before the world flood. Uh, just one moment. No problem. Okay, so Enoch is mentioned in, uh, I believe, Genesis uh, 2, no, 1, yeah, 1, 4, uh, or something like that. Early in the uh, story, yeah. <laughs> may, yeah, maybe 2, 4. But yes, very early in the Bible, he's mentioned, but only very briefly. And it says that uh, Enoch uh, walked with God, and God took Enoch, and he was not. Uh, and it also says that uh, he lived during the time when the sons of God came down and bore wives to the uh, sons of man. Uh, and these were like uh, giants or the titans of old, mythic heroes, or uh, ostensibly the elder deities of the Greek uh, Olympian pantheon. Uh, so that's about all that was known of Enoch for presumably the last aeon until around the 1800s when uh, uh, I believe it was James Bruce. I don't yep, remember. Same guy who gave us the Bruce Codex with the Pista Sophia, I believe. Yeah. Uh, he was looking for uh, the source of the Nile River in Ethiopia and found on, uh, uh, on, and on, on an island in the middle of a lake that was close to the source for the Nile River, a group of Hebrew uh, Ethiopians who were preserving uh, the traditions, not only of the Keber Nagast and how they had stolen the, uh, 
uh, Ten Commandments on the Two Stones of uh, the Tablets of Testimony from the Temple of Solomon, uh, but also the Apocryphal Book of Enoch. One of the great mysteries of John Dee's era is how did John Dee know uh, anything, if he did even, about the legend of the Enochian angels uh, from the Enochian Apocrypha? And it's possible because the Slavonic translation of the Book of the Watchers, which is a, a, an abridged version or shortened version of the Book of Enoch in Ethiopia, uh, the Slavic or Slavonic version may have been known to John D. in the 1500s, but there's no direct evidence to state uh, with certainty that he did know of it. So that may be one of the greater Enochian anomalies, as I call them. Uh, nevertheless, uh, in Ethiopian Enoch and in the uh, Slavonic Book of the Watchers or uh, Enoch 2 or Enoch Book 2 or the Secrets of Enoch, uh, there was a, a legend uh, that was also preserved in the Essene Qumran uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, but in the Essene Qumran Dead Sea Scrolls, there was also another chapter or book in addition to the Book of Enoch that was called the Book of the Giants. And the Book of the Giants, uh, the Ethiopian and Slavonic Enoch, uh, all describe the same events from the same time period that happened prior to the Deluge, or what the Greeks called during uh, the time period of Atlantis. Fascinating and very awesome. Uh, Vince, do you have a question for Jonathan? Yeah, I do. This is a little bit uh, of a different um, uh, direction, but Jonathan, of all the different things you've studied and know about, is there a particular, um, you know, story from the past, you know, system, cosmology, uh, what have you, that you can directly personally relate to? I mean, have you had any experiences of communication with, you know, beings from the non-physical world and so forth? And um, that's the question. Well, that's a great question too. Um, I, to go back to when I was about probably three years old, uh, I had a dream or possibly not a dream about being abducted by an alien uh, that I made into a comic book later when I was about seven or eight that was called The Alien and the Blackberry Juice. Uh, I don't know if that was uh, a legit experience, a dream or what. Uh, and the comic book was only a few pages long and has since been lost. So I don't really recall it deeply. Uh, that would be the only form of supernatural or, or naturally supernatural type experience I could say I've ever had, uh, naturally paranormal experience. Uh, other than that, I've done a lot of drugs I've never done ayahuasca or DMT, <laughs> however, uh, and it's supposedly on ayahuasca and DMT or even uh, 5-MeO DMT uh, that one will experience these uh, sorts of beings. Uh, and whether these are extraterrestrial biological entities or the uh, plant spirits uh, is still a, still a, a topic of modern debate among uh, psychonauts and people who consider themselves uh, academic scholars of these topics. Uh, my drug of choice was actually uh, LSD, which I can't recommend to anybody uh, because it can give people a bad trip. I never had one. Uh, what happened for me was that I experienced the Chikai Bardo once or twice uh, and was able to uh, bring back some observations from during that. And that's peppered throughout my works uh, in hopefully a helpful way. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of what I learned in that state uh, while reading books in that state and actually was about metaphysics and theoretical cosmologies, things of that sort, uh, and still hasn't been, it still hasn't been accepted as being valid by modern theoretical physicists uh, tachyons, for example, 
Uh, I have a personal theory that I've never heard anyone else espouse. Uh, the tachyons, which are faster than the uh, faster than light particles, or particles that can travel faster than the speed of photons in a vacuum, uh, that these are the uh, cause of the force carrying. These are the cause for or the force carrying particle of uh, gravity, uh, because gravity is a an attractive force, unlike the other three elemental uh, universal forces. Uh, weak and strong uh, uh, fusion and fission and uh, electromagnetism, which are all repulsive forces. Uh, but I believe that if tachyons travel faster than light, they can also travel backwards or opposite the arrow of entropy backwards in time. So they may be a repulsive force, but simply acting in an opposite chronological uh, form uh, on the same material uh, substances we measure the other three forces by. But again, I've never heard anybody else say that, and it's probably just a half-baked acid head theory, at least <laughs> at this point. Well, still, um, many scientists start out with, uh, you know, ideas that aren't, well, in fact, any new idea starts out with something that no one's probably considered seriously before, right? Even the theory of relativity um, was... Uh, resisted. They've spent years trying to prove it, especially general rel relativity. So Certainly. there you have it. Certainly. Uh, it was the same also with uh, heliocentrism. When that came along, uh, people were still arguing over the retrograde uh, uh, epicycles of the planets uh, being caused by, um, yeah, these smaller loops in their in their orbits uh people didn't expect uh heliocentrism to be true and it was rejected violently for a long time until finally it was accepted as uh, a necessary fact of reality yeah well you know i have a personal theory about that i think the sun is the center of the solar system and the earth or, or as the center of the solar system too it just depends on your perspective <laughs> It's a lot more convenient to think of the sun as the center, but even the sun does not is not in the exact center because the center of gravity of the solar system is not smack dab in the center of the sun. So, correct. Really? Even the sun revolves, yeah, and rotates. Yeah, yeah. There's uh -huh. a point. Yeah, it might be. I don't know where it is. It might be inside the sun somewhere. I, mean, I don't know if the center of gravity is the solar system. It depends on where the planets are too, but uh, everything um, orbits around a center of gravity. So. Yeah, what you're talking about is the uh, two loci uh, or locus points uh, yeah. that form an epicycle, or not an epicycle, uh, an uh, eclipse in the yeah, orbit. Ellipse. Right. Uh, an ellipse, yes. Pardon me. <laughs> no, but no yeah, um, yeah, like uh, there's this, and this has gone to the premise of Nemesis or a dark star, or even Vulcan, uh, a so-called dark planet orbiting the, uh, the sun opposite Earth in our early theories, uh, there's the sun itself, and then there would be uh, an, another external locus uh, or uh, centroid point for the ellipse of any orbiting body. So the Earth, for example, uh, orbits in a relatively elliptical path, uh, and its secondary uh, locus is outside of the sun or possibly near the surface of the sun, but nevertheless isn't exactly and even the sun itself has two of these because it uh, orbits around the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. Interesting. Very interesting indeed. And yeah, I assume you don't think the Earth is flat, do you, Jonathan? <laughs> because uh, I was going to ask you, what do you think about this age of uh, continued conspiracies? Do you see them as distractions or... Is this the, the, the collective consciousness really starting to search as a traditional or sensible reality or the, the official narrative of the world just makes less and less sense? What, what do you think? Uh, well, I don't think the earth is flat. <laughs> Good. I agree with everything else about that, though. It's definitely what the Bilderberg group called a post-truth world that we're living in now. Uh, there's uh, 
plethora or pleroma of, of information available online. Uh, and most of it is mythic and fictional, uh, modern conspiracy theories being a form of uh, contemporary mythology even. Uh, nevertheless, a lot of it is true in the sense that it has a moral, uh, a useful moral uh, value. Uh, and a lot of it is just misinformation or disinformation. For example, Q, uh, the QAnon phenomenon, uh, that we've seen so be so influential recently. Uh, I speculate that that might be a, an artificial intelligence uh, program itself that is releasing these uh, drops of data or these uh, files of information. Uh, it certainly doesn't seem to be a group of normal thinking people. Uh, and from what little I've seen of it, it does seem more like a chatbot in the way it words uh, things and in, in the way it uh, so-called thinks. That's funny. Never heard that before. Yeah, it is interesting. I wouldn't be surprised. For a long time, I thought it was Steve Bannon. I was suspicious he was behind the whole Q thing, but uh, who knows? But uh, yeah, there's so much of it right now and like you said uh i think we should it's, it's the lessons the moral morality the mythology behind it and as i tell people uh what does it say about you what's going on in your internal world that this conspiracy spoke to you because most conspiracies as we know aren't going to end i mean they still have yearly conferences on the kennedy assassination even if it's obvious what happened now, <clears throat> CIA, but they're going to, for decades and generations, people will be talking about uh, the Kennedy assassination. So it's better if we looked inward and see how, uh, how it helps us or what is it pointing for us to do to make a change, I would say. Uh, but that it is. And on a little side note there, Jonathan, uh, you have a video about uh, the th more or less the theology of the Sith, and you talk about the kings and the Star Wars mythology. And that's interesting because, again, in a sink, just like a week or two ago, I was doing some research on the, on the Sith metaphysics, and somehow, because I was trying to tie it into... Uh, of all things, Abraxas and some Gnostic theology. But uh, why did you decide to do, uh, uh, you know, a video about the Sith? Well, that's a valid question. Um, that's actually my most popular video series. Is really? My uh, Star Wars philosophy lecture series oh, cool. uh, on YouTube. It's had tens of thousands more hits than any of the others, which I consider all the others far more important, more interesting. Uh, nevertheless, the Star Wars one is the most popularly accessible, uh, and it's just talking about the hyperspace drive, uh, the Jedi code, and the particular video that I've released most recently is a compilation of a series of videos I'd released earlier that talks about the uh, King's List of the uh, Sith uh, Empire and the Sith Rule of Two and things like that. And this, I mean, is this is canonical as far as Star Wars is, right? Uh, it was until Disney bought it. Oh, and no. And <laughs> then as soon as that Talk happened... Talk about the evil then, empire. Yeah. yeah. 100%. 100%. <laughs> that totally squashed my independent research and made it all irrelevant. And they rewrote history. And it's just a corporate debacle. It's a fiasco. But yeah, since Disney bought Star Wars, I can't say for sure that anything in any of my Star Wars videos is any longer canonical. Uh, it was at one point when Lucas owned everything, but it, uh, yeah. And if you could uh, associate Sith theology with any historical religion, what would you say, Jonathan? What's the closest? Well, that's a good question too. Probably the neo-Sathianism uh -huh. uh, of today that we see is most parallel to that for a plethora of reasons. But don't the Sith want more than anything? How did how did somebody put it to me? They want to use the Force to be free of the Force. They really, in a way, it's 
maybe Hindu, they 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 see the force as karma and they want out, which definitely is a Gnostic idea. Yeah, I'd agree with all that. Yeah. Uh, the uh, idea of the dark side of the force uh, being a pathway to, as they say, many abilities that some consider to be unnatural uh, does relate to the same thing in the Star Wars universe is what we would call magic uh, and mental manifestation, for example, in uh, our own reality. Uh, in the history of uh, Darth Plagueis, who was the uh, uh, mentor of Darth uh, Sidious, who was, spoiler alert, Emperor Palpatine, <laughs> uh, Darth Plagueis was able to uh, reanimate the midichlorians uh, from death uh, thus es essentially bringing a being back to life after they had died. Uh, and in the same sense, uh, the Neosethians of today wish to uh, resurrect or reanimate or uh, uh, reincarnate Jesus in some form uh, by uh, ceremonially, ceremonially uh, ritualistically burning down the world to uh, summon him forth. I think there's a lot of parallels there. Yeah, yeah. Well, something I will definitely look onto. But then again, why bother? Because for all we know, that there's rumors that Disney might scratch the last three movies and make them non-canonical. And then, Jonathan, you'll be right back at the top again. So no, who let's, knows? Let, let's hope it happens. Let's hope Disney, well, I don't know if they'll come to their senses, but let's hope the pressure is enough to break them. Uh, they're a major corporation. I have no faith in them in <laughs> doing no the right soul. thing. You just wait. Baby Darth Vader's next. 100%. <laughs> Baby Vader. <laughs> a bobblehead. Yeah. I, 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 <laughs> Baby I'm Vader really bobblehead. Enjoy, I've enjoyed The Mandalorian. I have to admit, it's closer to episode four's. Uh, ethos than anything uh that's been put out for a long time or episode five uh, episode six i have ugh, uh, i have my problems with episode six but anyway and interesting you say that the sith uh videos get all the traffic but uh for example i really liked your um your youtube uh, your documentary pyramids prodigy of atlantis and yeah. you've got some really good views on that one. I know it's about five years old, or but uh, you got over 40,000, and you put a lot of work into it. It's a three-hour documentary, and it's well done. You got all the visuals, all the charts, everything else. It's a, excellent work. Maybe you can share with the audience about this, because I would highly recommend the audience to go watch uh, Prodigy of Atlantis. Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, that was the very first uh, longer than feature length uh, documentary video I'd done. Uh, so it, it seems to have been the most popular uh, overall long term uh, in terms of views. Uh, I've done a bunch since then, uh, but they haven't gotten as many views uh, yet. Uh, Prodigy of Atlantis talks about um, the alignment of the pyramids in Giza, Egypt, and in Teotihuacan, uh, Mexico, uh, with Orion's belt uh, in the constellation of Orion and uh, the three belt stars, uh, Alnatak, uh, Alnalam, and uh, uh, something else, I forget. Uh, yeah, it's, it's as thorough as I could make it. Uh, the only speculative uh, things that it mentions are the use of steam as a cutting device and uh, animals and wooden cranes as possible uh, additional uh, methods of construction. Uh, everything else in it is more or less mainstream. Uh, I tried to shy away as much as possible from the ancient aliens hypothesis or uh, telekinesis being used to uh, build them as well as uh, the theory that they were simply tombs where people were buried uh, because I consider both of those to be opposite ended fringe uh, theories. You, you, you don't see them as tombs, do you? 
Uh, no, 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 they were used ritualistically to, uh, at, at at least one point, they were used ritualistically to uh, mummify the bodies, but there there were never people buried in them like tombs. Uh, the tombs in Egypt were all at uh, where was it? Uh, Memphis, right? Or uh, yeah, nah, I'm sorry, I'm terrible with names and such. But, oh, same here, uh, the, same here. The, the yeah, Valley of the Kings. I don't think there were tombs. Yeah. Yeah, all the bodies were buried in the Valley of the Kings. Oh, okay, okay. So real quick, what do you think was their purpose for the audience? Uh, The pyramids? I I think that they were constructed as uh, essentially a library of information. Uh, I think they were aligned to the pyramids of Orion's belt in order to draw our attention uh, across history not only to that constellation, but to its orientation relative to our planet's surface. Uh, The uh, pyramids at Teotihuacan, which were built thousands of years later, but which were aligned to the same um, constellation, uh, uh, the pyramids at Teotihuacan are arranged at a right angle to the pyramids at Giza, uh, to where the uh, Avenue of the Dead at Teotihuacan uh, is a east to west uh, road, and uh, the pyramids at Giza are oriented in a more or less uh, north south uh, arrangement where the uh, Mintaka, that's the other name of the uh, constellation star, uh, where the smallest uh, pyramid is south west of uh, the larger one, which is also southwest of the Great Pyramid of Cheops. Uh, These may have been oriented to an earlier uh, North Pole position, as well as uh, as well as Angkor Wat in Cambodia, which was built even later than Teotihuacan, uh, which was built long after Giza. But all of these may form an equator that points to a different location for a north and south pole. Uh, that's at least one theory uh, in the Atlantis Blueprint book by uh, Colin Wilson and uh, Rand Flamath. Very cool. Always cool bringing up Colin Wilson. Well, we're getting at the end. Vince, do you have any a last question for Jonathan? A burning desire, as we say in AA? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, as long as we're on the pyramids, so how about initiations and astronomical sightings and so forth? Um, do you think the pyramids had any involvement with those activities? Well, they were definitely astronomical uh, in their orientation and in their uh, uh, architecture. Uh, I think that uh, throughout time since they were built, they've definitely also been used in initiation, in initiation rituals. Uh, however, I'm not sure 100% as to what their original purpose uh, was, so I can't say with certainty. Uh, it would only be theory and speculation. Yeah, it's interesting, the Queen's Chamber, the King's Chamber, the pit, and all that and the, of, of the great you know, Pyramid of Giza, those are kind of interesting structures. But I guess we'll have to wait for another time to further explore the pyramids. There you go. Okay. Indeed, yes. Well, for the audience, Jonathan, uh, his documentary is three hours long. I watched the whole thing because it really was fascinating. I think you should check out too. But um, we are at the end, Jonathan. Uh, Could you please share with the audience links to your work? Because we only did a, a sliver of your overall research. So let the audience where they can find out more about you on the internets. Okay. Um, I have uh, a couple of websites of my own uh, that you can go to that don't depend on social media, where I'm likely, as we all are, eventually to be deplatformed from. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, my main site is benpadia.com, B E N P A D I A H, after Yeshua Ben Padia and the Angel Scroll. Uh, my secondary site is the Pythagorean order of death dot ning dot com, which the Pythagorean order of death is all one word and then dot 
N-I-N-G.com. Uh, I also post my uh, PDFs of all my eBooks to issue.com, which is I-S-S-U-U.com uh, under the username Ben Patia. Uh, I'm on YouTube as user Ben Patia, B-E-N-P-A-D-I-A-H. Uh, and other than that, it's just social media sites. So I can be found on uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I have a Patreon page. No one's donated. Uh, I have an old MySpace account and a Reverb Nation for my uh, rap songs. And uh, one of those is also about the history of the pyramids. So if you wanted to learn more, you could check that out in song format. Awesome. And as always, we'll have some links in our show notes, audience. But we are at the end. Vance, thank you for keeping us company on this fascinating journey. Yeah, it has been fascinating. And Jonathan, it's been a great pleasure to hear all about all the things you know. And um, I know there's even more. So perhaps another time. Indeed. It was a fascinating conversation and audience check out more of Jonathan's work because you will go to, you will go down some wonderful rabbit holes and you were going to learn a lot. So Jonathan, uh, thank you for your time. Thanks for all the work you've done and thanks for coming on a on bite. Thank you so much guys. And thanks for letting me ramble. Uh, thanks for doing what you do. Uh, I'm glad to have uh, been here and I hope everybody enjoys, uh, enjoys my work. <laughs>